Good morning. Welcome to everybody who's here today and welcome to our international audience. And today is a very special day on the biblical calendar. Now on our Roman calendar that we use in America, it's just the 3rd of October. And our churches are getting ready to, for a big celebration this month. Do you know what it is? Halloween. Right up the street here, if you go down Rogers Lake Road and go all the way to the end of it, there's a big old church over there. And every year they have a, on their marquee, it says Fall Festival, October 31st. And, uh, but, but what about God's festival? You know, God has a fall festival. And uh, there are thousands of Christians right now around the world that are gathering together today to celebrate and, uh, on th this festival. So there are Christians that do it, and of course Jews. But the Christians are getting together and having a church service and singing, and, and that's good. And I wish we had enough people to have a camp out. And I'll talk more about that when we get into the message here. But let's ask God's blessing on the service and on each one who's here and each one who's watching. Eternal God, we thank you now for the holy days that you've given us that teach us your master plan. We ask your anointing that we may understand and have a greater discernment today of what these holy days represent. Please anoint and inspire the speakers and anoint the hearing of everyone who's in this room and everybody watching by the internet. Bless us with a deeper understanding than we've ever had before. We ask your blessing and presence in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Without further ado, I'd like to present to you uh, the gentleman who's going to be giving a sermonette this morning. He is... Uh, uh, our dean of students, he's been with us for years and years. I think he came in, what, about 17, 16, 17 years ago. He's been with us a long time. So anyway, without further ado, for a sermonette this morning, Dr. Stephen Soltz. Thank you, Dr. Slough. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, such a blessing to see everybody today. Um, we thank God for your presence, whether you're here and uh, you're here live with us, or whether you are sharing uh, with us via the live stream, um, or whether you'll see this video in the future. We we, ju we just thank God for you, um, and we and we again want to give uh, uh, we want to thank God for for Dr. Slough and the vision that um, that he's uh, allowing us to uh, to be a part of as he celebrates these holidays and gives us the knowledge and the tools from the Bible. To be able to better celebrate these, um, these these holy days, excuse me, these holy days, and 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 that brings up what I want to talk to you about today um, is I want to talk about the mindset, the, the the mindset of embracing the these holy days, um, the the culture that that you were born in, it, it basically gave you a system of beliefs and behaviors. As you grew older. You either fully accepted, began to question, or deny some of those beliefs you were indoctrinated to understand from birth. That's what led me on a quest for a deeper understanding of God and God's word, or if I could even believe his word was true. We're blessed here at Ambassador Christian College to have a, a system, uh, systematic theology course called Prove All Things that uh, is taught in the associate's term of the, uh, of the college here that goes through those core beliefs and helps you to understand. And now we know we can stand on God's word because we have proven that it's true. It's a promise, it's a, it's a, it's a premise uh, that we can fully acknowledge the holy days uh, as well because we've, uh, again, proven that, that the word is, <clears throat> excuse me, that the word is true. Arm, armed with that knowledge is what brings us here today. Um, believing in the holy days, believing in the, the weekly Sabbath, because it's also a weekly Sabbath as well. Um, and because we've learned that through the course. But do we have the mindset to embrace the holy days? Have 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 we have we really and have we really do we really understand um, what we're doing and how we're celebrating those days? There are churches. There, there are churches that teach what's called holidays, right? There, you know, certain churches, most churches around the world teach what's called holidays, and those holidays are are basically special events celebrated in the context of a biblical event, right? 
they're, they're, they're celebrated in the context of a biblical event. Um, the two everybody knows, Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter, those are, those are, those are holidays celebrated um, with a biblical context. Society teaches you how to think in relation to those holidays, how to feel, what to wear, how to participate. It's society's teachings and the cultural buildup to these holidays that make that that make uh, that manage, excuse me, that manage your spending decisions, food choices, and family gatherings. But today I want to use a word and it's called shift. I want to shift. We want to shift. Because Holy Day celebrations require a shift from what most of the world has learned about the uh, has learned about the context of these biblical events. We have to shift from that thinking because you were taught from birth, most of us were taught from birth that Christmas represented this day. Easter represents this. And it's all been a biblical context. But that's we're, we're, we're celebrating holy days here. We, 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 the whole, this is a holy day. And so do we have a context to celebrate that in? Do we, do we, do we have that context? It's, it's that shift in mindset that everyone has today um, that has us here. Um, and it's because you, dis you decided to shift your mindset. You decided to shift from what you may have learned earlier to what you've now learned because you were proven, because the word was proven in your life. And that's what has, mo that's what has us here today, what, what, what this word has proven us. That's why we're few in number. But we're going on what we've learned, and that's the word. So it's, uh, we have to begin to embrace uh, what some may think is a new thing. Holy days are, are new to some people. Um, as, 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 as you learn more and more about the word, uh, this may be your first time celebrating a holy day. Uh, or this may be your first season of celebrating holy days. But we have to shift to this new way of doing things while, other, while other, others of us are, are just simply confirming the new moon in Jerusalem and, and preparing for the next holy day. Um, so in embracing a holy day, it, it takes us back to a simpler time. We now, we now have somewhat of a mindset, but, but to embrace that, we have to go back to a simpler time. A time when the opinions of men didn't influence the changes in God's word, the same word that we've already proven to be true. John tells us in the opening verse of his gospel that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 2. That simpler time is in the beginning with God. That simpler time we're looking for when we're looking to embrace these holy days, it's with God. And how do we get to the beginning with God? You get there by starting here. You get there by starting here. You want to start in his word and start in the beginning of his word. Because as you go through his word, you will come across events. But some of those events are, but some of these, but some of those events are in the context of what the holy day is really about. Those, 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 those events that happen are in that context. And that's what Dr. Slough is going to pour more into you later on, um, is those contexts uh, of, of, those, of those days in the Bible. It's in his word that you will find that mindset to embrace these holy days. It's through the act of observance that you begin to fully appreciate the significance of the events and how they help shape your relationships, how they help shape your life, but more importantly, how they help shape your walk with Christ. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 those, it's, it's those events and it's those teachings and, it's, and it's, it, it's, it's here where the word is taught and that the word is, is truly expounded on that we get what we need in order to 
fully embrace what these holy days mean. Um, you know, there, we don't, there's no commercials for this time of season in the Holy Bible. There's no commercials. But when you get in certain seasons of the year, you can't go outside the door without being inundated, <laughs> being inundated by what the world is celebrating. You know, they took, the, they, they put an eye in because they made it about themselves and they took the why out. So it went from, from, so it went from being holy to holly. It went from being holy to holly. So we want to get back to what's holy because the holly we can't prove in here. That's right. It's only the holy that we can prove in here. And that's what we learn through God's word. Amen. 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 Be blessed. Amen. Oh, thank you. I got to go water. Okay, um, great. Got questions already? It's not necessarily a question, but you know, he stirred up a little controversy that comes up about this time of year. Oh, okay. From one of our people that's been watching online for a while. Shame on you. I know. I okay. was waiting for it. I was looking. Um, All right. Well, look we'll ahead and take that now. Can we go ahead and kind of clear that up now before sure. it starts yeah, getting out of control absolutely. On, in the comments, and I yeah. can't stop it? Yeah. Will you address about the non-religious holidays like Fourth of July and Thanksgiving and Veterans Day? And sure, yeah, I've done that before. I know, but just kind of because it started again. And I wanted, okay, there's I absolutely to no sin involved in celebrating non-religious secular holidays. July Fourth is the birth of our nation, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Purim was a non, technically a non-religious holiday that Mordecai invented for the Jews and. God never condemned that. In fact, Jesus himself went to a Jewish holiday called the Feast of Dedication, which we believe to be Hanukkah. Nothing wrong in that. So, so Jesus himself participated in secular holidays. Now, if that holiday comes from a pagan religion in honor of a pagan God, Jesus didn't do that. So July 4th, Flag Day, President's Day, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. What's wrong with setting aside a day to give God thanks? Now, what's wrong with that? So, No, there's nothing wrong with those days at all. And God nowhere forbids us to celebrate secular holidays as long as they're not in honor of some pagan god. By the way, uh, for those of you, he, he brought up the birth of Christ. That was uh, last week. Jesus was born, according to all scholarship, around the last week of September. So, And there's not a church in all this area that I know of that celebrated his birthday. The no, person no church that's arguing there. with you just posted, that's not biblical, Keith. I'm getting ready to delete it, but would you address that? What's not biblical? What you just said about being able to celebrate secular holidays, because this person's not going to stop. They're going to. Well, if they don't want to celebrate them, I would say it's, you don't have to celebrate Thanksgiving. You don't have to, but the Bible says over and over, give thanks to God. Now, what would be wrong if I today set up a, a Thanksgiving day and all of us are going to get together tomorrow and come here and we're just going to praise God and thank God? Now, would that be a sin? Well, if we only did things that were in the Bible, we wouldn't be driving cars. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, there's a lot of stuff yeah. we wouldn't be doing. Here, anyway. Here's the thing. A sin is a transgression of God's law. If there's no law that says thou shalt not and you want to do it, there's no, like you're wearing a red shirt. There's no scripture that says you can't wear a red shirt. As long as the scripture, <laughs> as long as the scripture doesn't say thou shalt not, you want to wear one, wear one. And uh, so, no, as long as the scripture doesn't forbid it, you have freedom. You have liberty in Christ. All right. Any other questions before I get started? No, because I, I bet I'm, I'm, I'm not going to leave these argumentative comments. Okay. I'm delete them. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, because the forum is not to argue; it's ask questions. Right. Right. It's the argument. Uh, but anyway, we thank everyone who is participating and, and trying to learn, and, and you know, that's and it's fine to express a, a, opinions. But uh, we want to get into the Word of God today, and I like what Doctor Souls ex explained a while ago that today's not a holiday; it's a holy day. So, you know, July 4th is a holiday. Thanksgiving is a holiday. You know, Abraham Lincoln uh, did not establish a holy day because only God is holy and only God can establish a holy day. But he established a holiday, and that's fine. I could establish a holiday tomorrow. We're all going to get together. No, we're not going to do this, but I could <laughs> say we're all going to come back here tomorrow and we're just going to worship and praise God all day long and order pizza. There'd be nothing wrong in that. But today, but see, I can't make a day holy. 
you can take off, tell your boss, I'm not coming in next uh, Thursday. I'm going to stay home all day and fast and pray. That's fine. If your boss says go for it, and that day is still not a holy day, although you're setting it aside for holy reasons. You're not watching TV, but you can't make a day holy. Does that make sense? Only God can make a day. And God set aside seven annual holy days. Now, I want to, uh, every year I, I talk about this, and most of you say, I know where he's going. I, I've been here every year to hear him. I'm going to approach it a little differently this year. Listen to what Jesus said. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, loaded down like a, like a truck that uh, loaded down with something. I, on the way here this morning, I was sitting at the stoplight, and over there in the lane was a dump truck, and they had a little sign there that says, been there, dump that. I've never, <laughs> never seen that before. But um, Jesus said, if you're heavy laden, you're loaded down, he said, you come to me and I will give you rest. Yes, sir. What's that scripture? Oh, yeah, I hadn't given it to you yet. I'm getting ready to. But, yeah, I don't want everybody turning to it because I want you to hear it first. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. God's religion is a wonderful religion compared to Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism, or some of the other isms. Because God's religion is a religion of rest. God said, now look, every week I want you to take a whole day and rest from your labors. And God commanded that. And people want to work seven days a week and think that they're, they're in bondage to have to obey God. What is being in bondage about, about being able to just rest? Working seven days a week to me is bondage. In fact, working six days a week, I used to say, oh. I'd always get a job trying to work no more than five days a week. That's enough for me. Come Friday, I was ready for the weekend. But God said, no, look, one whole day rest. I like that religion. And then... That's every seventh day. And then every seventh month, God said, now I want you to take a whole week and rest. And most of the people were farmers, and so they would come in from their fields, and uh, they would take a whole week and celebrate. And it was at the time of the harvest. Uh, Exodus 23 calls it the Feast of In Gathering. When they gathered in the harvest, God said, now you got all this food, let's eat. So God's religion is a religion of feasting and resting. Rest from your labors, come in, let's feast. And during that time, they had what the Bible refers to as tabernacles, the feast or the festival of tabernacles. People who don't observe these holy days misunderstand, and they think it's the feast of the tabernacle in the wilderness where they offered up animal sacrifices. Oh, no, 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 totally different. Tabernacles here refers to tents, and some modern versions translate it the festival of tents. They would get a tent or a shelter, uh, some temporary shelter, and go out and have what Americans call a camp meeting. Now, the interesting thing is most churches, by the way, that reference is, uh, for those of you who do want to know, that reference is Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Most churches sponsor camp meetings. Verse 29, Jesus said, take my yoke. Yeah, there's a yoke to being a Christian, but take my yoke and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find, there's that word again, rest to your souls. Not just rest to your body, but your soul. Today, people are all stressed out. And medical experts say one of the primary reasons for cancer, and everybody in this room has been affected by somebody that's had cancer. I've had at least a couple of aunts that died from cancer. Uh, my grandfather did. Uh, I, don't, I can't even begin to remember how many people I've known that died of cancer, and you do too. But they say one of the primary reasons is stress. God said, I want you to rest. People wouldn't be dying of stress. And a lot of the diseases that people die from are stress-induced. God said, take my yoke upon you. You'll find rest to your souls, your psyche, your, your mental attitude. For my yoke is easy compared to the world, and my burden is light. Every denomination that I know of now, there may be some exceptions, but but I know the Methodists sponsor a camp meeting. They've got a campground up in Junalaska, Junalaska, however you say it. I've never actually been up there, but people would take off from work, go up there and stay a week and camp out. The Baptists have camp meetings. Uh, a friend of mine up in Virginia, she said, uh, before she ever learned about the Holy Days, she learned about them from me, she said, you know, the pastor at the First Baptist Church in Alexandria in Virginia has always had his church to take a week off in October. And everybody takes off from work and kids 
get out of school and have a big camp meeting. She said, I've been wondering all this time, why does he do that in October? He was apparently celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Pat Robertson, this week, he's celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. How they're doing it exactly, I don't know. But God said, look, take off from work and have a camp meeting. Now somebody's gonna say, well, where's our camp meeting? If, if, I had a, if I actually had a campground, we were gonna get together and meet, how many of you would even show up? You might show up for a few minutes and go home. But yeah, one or two of you would. But you know, what I'd like to do is to have eventually, and this is what I'm hoping for, we can get churches, invite all the churches in Kannapolis to come out to a camp meeting. And we're gonna show them about, we're gonna show them praise and worship, which we're trying to establish here. We're gonna have beautiful music and we're gonna have musicians that can play the guitar play the piano and can sing, and we're gonna have a really good time. And then we can invite the churches to come out if we have enough people that wanna do that. And that's why I'm hoping that all of you'd be willing to do it. So, so what we're doing now is celebrating the actual holy days. But so God said every seventh day you rest. Every seventh month you take a week off and rest. Every seventh year you take the whole year off because that was an agrarian society. It was a society where they were farmers. God said, don't sow anything, don't reap anything. I'll bless you on the sixth year. You'll have enough to get you to the eighth year. And you just take a year off. In fact, God said in Deuteronomy, when, when you get married, don't be charged with any business for one whole year and cheer up your wife. And a lot of us men would think, yeah, any woman that would marry us, we'd need to cheer them up for a year. With. <laughs> so when do you think a lot of those guys got married? They waited till the seventh year, and then they, they couldn't work anyway, and that's when a lot of them got married. The seventh year started, that sabbatical year started in the autumn at this time of the year. So they would get together and get married, maybe like this week, get married for the Feast of Tabernacles, and I've known people that choose that time to get married because they're going to be off from work anyway. Imagine taking a whole week off and then take the whole year off and just take a year-long honeymoon. Now, that's God's religion. Man's religion is let's dress up our kids like ghost goblins and Darth Vader and send them out to rob the neighbors of their candy. Let's take an occult holiday that glorifies witchcraft and let's bring that into the Christian church. Oh, we'll change the name of it. We'll call it Trick or Trunk or some silly name like that. Is it Trunk or Treat? Oh, you can tell I'm not involved. Is that what it is? Trunk or Treat. All right. They do it at the church by my house where the A&P used to. And they, and they do it October 31st. So you can change the name of a lion and call it a rabbit, but if it's hungry, you better run from that rabbit. <laughs> All right? So no matter what you call it, it's still the same thing. Christmas was a holiday originating in sun worship, and you can bring it into the church and say, well, now we're going to worship somebody else with it. But God said don't do that. And Deuteronomy 12, it, it specifically says, don't say, how did they worship their gods? I'll do likewise. And the next verse says, don't do that to the Lord thy God. Don't do what they did to the Lord your God. So what they did to their gods, don't you do to me. And yet the church world says, but that's Old Testament. Well, it's also the Bible. Jesus said, live by every word of God. Amen. And then every 50th year, God said, now take two whole years off and have a jubilee. No. Now, but here's the thing. This feast, I'm going to show you, this feast is a shadow of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And the whole world's going to be keeping these festivals. Can you imagine when everybody takes, when the, all the nations in the entire world takes the 50th year off and worships the King of Kings who's going to be ruling this earth? The singing, the praising, the good music on radio, the praise music. Every time you turn around, somebody's praising Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you go to Japan or China, they're all praising Jesus. Now, can you imagine living in a world like that? That's the way it's going to be one day. It's going to be a world without war, without plagues and pestilence and disease like we've got in our world. As, as people come in here wearing masks, we know what we're talking about. Jesus said in the last days there's going to be pestilence. Imagine a world where everybody is healthy, that everybody is happy, that everybody is productive, and when they do get sick, they can get healed very easily because they're taught faith and how to receive. The Bible says in Isaiah that Jesus is going to heal the lame, they're going to walk, he's going to heal the deaf, and they're going to hear, and the blind will see. When Jesus comes back, you say, you mean he's still going to be doing miracles? Well, what do you think? Hebrews 13, 8, what does that say? Yeah, all you scholars should know that one. He's the same today as he was yesterday. 
He'll be the same forever. When Christ returns and sick people come to him for healing, he's going to go right on and, and con continue his ministry of healing people. In fact, he's still continuing today if a person will have faith. In Hebrews 4, and I want to turn to Hebrews 4. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Jesus said, Come to me and I'll give you rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us the gospel is preached. What is the gospel? It's the gospel of God's grace, as well as unto them. But the word didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith. Without faith you cannot please God and them who heard it. For we who have believed do enter into rest. The kind of rest that God wants to give you rest from stress so that your soul has rest, not just your body. That kind of rest you're not going to get staying out in the world all the time. A lot of celebrities, they burn the candle at both ends. They stay up and get drunk all night. They think they're having a good time and, and, and do drugs and all this stuff, and they shorten their life. They think they're having a good time, and they're still not happy, a lot of them, and they end up committing suicide, some of them. Robin Williams, you'd think, man, he was being one of the happiest people you could meet, but he wasn't. The only way to have true happiness is to come to Jesus Christ. That's the only way. For we who have believed do enter into rest, as he said, and then he quotes the scripture, as I've sworn in my wrath that they'll enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Why would he bring that up? The works of God were finished way back then. Why would he bring that up in connection with rest? All right, then he says in the very next sentence, for he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise or in this manner, quote, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now, you know, I've talked before about how that Peter says a day is like a thousand years to God and a thousand years is a day. And the early church believed in and wrote about, and that's how we know about, we've still got their writings. The early, early church believed that God set aside 7,000 years when he made Adam. And then after the end of that, then God the Father would come here to this earth and start a whole new chapter in, in history. And so we are now... If you look at genealogy, Adam was created around 6,000 years ago. That's easily done from studying the math and geology. So, you know, so-and-so is so old, maybe got this son, so on, all the way back. And so Adam was created about 6,000 years ago. When Christ returns and then he rules for 1,000 years, 6 plus 1, that's 7,000 years. Yes, sir? So you're not saying that Earth is 6,000 no. years ago? No, Earth could be so, so millions or billions. So from God, he's saying... That between Genesis 1 and 2, that's when the devil just shot down to earth. and There had to be a period of time. Right, mm -hmm. on, well, originally 6,000 6, years ago or whatever. Yeah. But before that, God had made the earth, and then he banished those people to the earth, and then yeah. he became. Yeah. So it says he became. Yeah, verse 2, the Hebrew says, the Hebrew word there is Yahya, mm -hmm. which actually is translated in chapter 2, verse 7 of Genesis as became. It says Adam became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Lot's wife became a pillar of salt, same word. And so there in verse 2, it should say, the earth became without form and void. Yeah, because uh, Jeremiah 4, I believe it is, says God didn't make the earth in uh, without form and void. He didn't make it that way, but it became that way. And Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. So <clears throat> it's interesting that at this time of the year, the Satanist, and I've seen him interviewed on television, at least one I remember, who said that Halloween was the chief satanic holiday on the satanic calendar why are christians bringing into their church a satanic holiday call it by any other name but why should christians even mess with it and they say well we want to get the kids off the street well that's a stupid thing why don't the parents say stay off the street they're little kids you don't have to dress them up as ghosts and demons and devils you just teach the kids you don't have to have a church to bring them off the street on halloween night just don't celebrate these pagan holidays now, people say, but I don't see anything wrong with it. I didn't ask you. God says, don't do it, period. That's how it was when I was a kid. My dad would tell me to do something. I'd say, why? Because I said so. That's the end of that. But, now, see, I had a good German dad. If he said it, that was the last word. And he had a belt that was that thick. I mean, ugh. 
And I was a good kid. I never deserved a spanking, you understand? <laughs> oh, shut up. But, uh, but once in a while, my dad, with his German temper, would uh, administer. You know, the Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. My dad loved me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, in verse 5, so verse 4 talks about that God rested on the seventh day. What's that got to do with with entering to the promised land. The promised land was rest from 40 years of wondrous wil wil uh, wilderness wanderings. I get my words sometimes confused. 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness. And before that, they were in slavery for many, many years. And so they were resting from their slavery. Now they're resting from 40 years. Now they still had to go in there and, and work, but it was rest from what they'd been in before. That, now they had their own country. Now they had God to be their king. They didn't have to pay taxes. Just a tithe. That was all. I mean, they had it made, but then they turned away from God. So here it says in verse 5, and in this place again, in this scripture again, in this passage, if they shall enter to my rest. Notice God's religion is a religion of rest. Seeing therefore, therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of what? Unbelief. Lack of faith. You can't please God without faith. Again, he limits a certain day saying in David today, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Jesus, and your margin correctly says Joshua, had given them rest, if it had been the true rest entering to, to the land of Canaan, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Jesus is coming back and he's going to bring that other day, that thousand year day, that seventh day millennium. Notice he connects the seventh day in verse four to this rest that we are about to enter. The Sabbath pictures the thousand year, the seventh millennium, the seventh thousand year millennium. So each day of the week represents, like Sunday represents the first thousand years, when before the flood and they were killing one another, then the second day represents the second thousand years, and now we're in the sixth day, approaching the seventh day millennium. So then he says here, uh, verse 8, if he had given them rest, then God wouldn't have spoken of another day, so the true rest is yet to come. Therefore, now therefore means because of what was just said. Verse 9, there remains, therefore. The Greek says, look in the margin of your King James Bible. There remains, therefore, a keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. Why is that? Because that day pictures what we are about to enter, the thousand-year seventh millennium. Any questions on that? So the Sabbath is a shadow of the millennium. Each of the days of the week are a shadow of things to come. Now, I want to go to um, chapter 18 of Acts. People will say, and you've heard this probably for years, I have, Paul, they say, did not keep those holy days. He only went to Jerusalem so he could actually have an audience to preach to. Acts, Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> I've heard that for years from different people. <clears throat> They say, Paul didn't keep the holy days. He only went to Jerusalem so he could be with an audience, so he'd have somebody to preach to. And there's a bunch of people coming down there, so he would come down there and preach to them. That's not true. Chapter 18, verse 18. Now, Paul is in a Gentile city, and he tells them, I've got to leave you. And he got a reason for leaving them. Verse 18, Paul, after this tarried yet a good while, he took his leave of the brethren, sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. Now, what vow required the shaving of the head? Nazarite vow. Why would Paul, now a converted Christian, still be involved with the, the laws found in the book of Leviticus and Numbers? Because Jesus said, not a jot or tittle would pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And in chapter 21, James tells Paul, go down there and be with charge with these men and let everybody know you still keep the law. And it says an offering was made for every one of them. That wasn't passing the plate. An offering at the temple is an animal sacrifice. And so Paul was still doing those things. Verse 19, he came to Ephesus and he left them, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer, tarry means to hang around, hang out longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, now did he go down to Jerusalem just to have an audience to preach to, or was he actually keeping these feast days? He bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem. Now, theologians believe this was the Feast of Tabernacles, which is what we're celebrating here today. Paul kept the feast days. 
But I'll return, if God will. I'll return. But I'm going down there to keep this festival. Now, the Greek word keep is poio. P-O-I-E-O. -E poio. It means to keep, observe, or celebrate. He was going down there to celebrate the feast. Now, it would not have been pure because you wouldn't have to worry about where you were for that. But for the Feast of Tabernacles, yeah, he wanted to be in Jerusalem. It didn't have to be. Passover and Pentecost and those three major festivals, they tried to be in Jerusalem when they could. You know, the Bible says in the last days, knowledge will be increased. Daniel 12, 4 says, at the time of the end, as we're approaching the time of the end. I talked to Billy Caldwell yesterday on the phone. He heard a preacher around 8 something in the morning who was preaching about these holy convocations, these festivals. He didn't. Did you ever find out who, the, who it was? David Chadwick. Oh, it really was him. Okay, wow, he's Presbyterian. And I said, well, was he for it or against it? He said he was for it. Is that right? For sure. So <clears throat> he was preaching on the holy days. More and more ministers are finding out about God's holy days, and more and more of them are telling people we need to observe them. Imagine that. Pat Robertson's keeping them. He's keeping today. He, he was presidential candidate in 1988, keeping the holy days, getting on national television pe and, and telling people that uh, we should keep the holy days. So you think I'm crazy? There's a bunch of us that's being crazy in the last days. We're getting into the Bible and finding out what it really says. I went to a Free Will Baptist church in Concord just a few years ago. Walked in there, and, the, and I didn't know the people there. The, the pastor's wife said, somebody told me you keep the holy days. I said, yes, ma'am. Tell me about them. I've been looking into it. I've been studying it. More and more people are getting interested. So don't you be the last one in your community or your neighborhood. Rather be the last one and you be at the tail end. Why don't you be at the head of the, of the bunch and you lead them. Don't follow. Be a leader and tell them about it. And tell them you've been doing it. You take the lead. And if you're a leader now, you'll be a leader in the kingdom of God. All right. That's my introduction. Let's get into the message here. <laughs> yes, we've got a question on there. All right. Go to Leviticus 23. That's where, we, that's where his question's at, too. Okay, let's go to Leviticus 23. You want it now? Yeah, go ahead and give me the question while we're turning I it I didn't read the whole question yet. I just see it. And it says, Dr. Slough, what do you mean? What What do you say Leviticus 23, 40 means, and how do you keep it? On the first day, you shall take the product of the Hathar tree, branches of palm trees, burrows of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord. Your God, seven days. Okay, I'll answer that question, but okay. in a few minutes, because I'm getting to it. I'm getting to that question. I'm, okay. I'm going to. I'm actually going to read that in just a few moments. So here we are in chapter 23. I want you to look at verse two. Now the Jews have feasts; they're welcome to them, but these are God's feasts. Verse two, con the second line concerning the feast of the Lord. Now Hanukkah's Jewish, Purim's Jewish, Ab the fifth, Ab the sixth, whatever that is. That's a Jewish holiday. They're welcome to them. But these are feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim holy convocations. These are my feasts, it says. Now, we have the weekly feast day, and then verse 4, these are the seasonal feast. And verse 6 talks about Passover for seven days. So in the spring, you have a seven-day festival. The first and last days are holy days. Verse 15, you have the day of Pentecost. You count seven weeks by counting seven Sabbaths. That's seven Saturdays. You have one more day. That's the 50th day. And verse 21, the third line says, Do no servile work. It's a statute forever. So Pentecost was still being kept by the early church. <clears throat> In verse 24, you have the Feast of Trumpets. Verse 25, do no servile work. Verse 27, on the tenth day of the seventh month. Now let me reiterate, this is not July. This is the seventh month counting from spring. Because God's year, the first spring month, the last winter month is March. And the first full spring month is April. And so the, that first month when the new moon is seen after spring starts, that's New Year's Day on God's calendar. And that's the first month. The second new moon is the second month because God started the months with the new moon. The seventh new moon, which was seen September the 18th this year at sundown, the seventh new moon begins the Feast of Trumpets. And there are four holy days in the seventh month. Four holy days. Any questions on that? So, verse 27, the tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. We talked about that this past Monday on the Day of Atonement. Now let's come to what this day is. Verse 34, speak to the children of Israel and say, the fifteenth day, that's today, fifteen days from the sighting of the new moon in Jerusalem, 
is the, in, uh, the 15th day of this seventh month, coming from spring, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. A tabernacle means a temporary dwelling, a tent, a shelter, a camping trailer maybe, or a, or a little cabin, a little wood cabin. But yeah, you can go down here to, um, uh, what is that place down there outside of Mount Pleasant? You know what I'm, what I'm talking about? Morrow Mountain. Oh, yeah. Morrow Mountain's got cabins. Anybody ever stayed in one of those cabins down there going camping? I haven't either. But it looks like it'd be pretty nice. Go down there and rent a cabin for several days and camp out. Morrow Mountain. I've seen them, but I've, I've, never, I've never been inside of one. But uh, there are churches that have campgrounds. They own their own campgrounds. Where was I? I was outside of Asheville a few years ago, and there was a big campground up there, Lutheran Campground. They sponsor camp meetings. So God, God is pretty smart, too. He sponsored a camp meeting for a whole week. I went to one in July uh, some years ago. My uncle, a uh, pastor of a certain denomination, he said, why don't you come to our camp meeting? It's going to be at such and such a place down here for a week in the hot part of July. <sighs> God says do it in the autumn after you've gathered in the harvest. I think it's better to do it this time of the year, although it's kind of hard to camp out when it gets cold. But... Uh, a lot of churches I know have gone down to southern Georgia at Jekyll Island. A number of churches have gone down there. Palm trees right there on the ocean. That big, beautiful full moon coming up over the ocean. And I, that's the first time I ever celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. But I went down there in Charlotte in the heat of July, and they're having a big meeting and celebrating and worshiping God and singing, and that's great. So God, God said, I want you to do that, and I want everybody to do it. And do it in the seventh month after you've gotten in all the food out of the field. You got all this food? Let's eat. That's what God says. What's the first thing you're going to do after you're resurrected? You're not going to rule the nations. You're not going to rule the city. What's the first thing you're going to do after you get raised from the dead? Supper. Supper. You're going to eat. I heard, I heard this. I never forgot it many years ago. A uh, preacher said, you know, the Japanese have a culture. The Chinese have a culture. Europeans have a culture. We all have different cultures. But there's one thing all cultures have in common. We like to eat. <laughs> and the first thing we're going to do when Jesus comes back and raises us from the dead is we're going to sit down and we're going to eat. I hope I'm sitting close to Abraham. I got some questions for him. <laughs> or maybe Noah. Tell me about that boat. You know, but just think, these people are going to be raised from the dead. And you're going to be sitting there at the table. That's going to be good, isn't it? That's what this feast pictures. In fact, this is a feast of having a bunch of suppers and dinners and it's so much fun when you get people together and get by the thousands. It's a lot of fun. A lot of traffic jams, but a lot of fun. All right. Now, he tells us, verse 35, on the first day, it, do no servile work. That's an annual holy day. It, and it says a holy convocation, meaning a commanded assembly. Verse 36, now this was only done by the Levites. Chapter 17 tells you that you can't do this. Only the Levites can. They are to make an offer. Uh, you shall offer an offering, an animal sacrifice made by fire. But only the priests were allowed to do that. On the eighth day will be a holy convocation. And it's a solemn assembly. Wait a minute. The Feast of Tabernacles is only seven days. That's all. Something happens at the end of the thousand years that's a cause for rejoicing. Now, there are several things that happen when the thousand years are, are over. The very, the very first thing you read about is uh, Satan will be released for just for a very short time, maybe only for a few days. Is that a time of rejoicing? Is that why we're celebrating and rejoicing with this eighth day? See, if, if every church would keep the holy days, they'd start asking these questions and saying, I wonder what this means. Because these holy days are shadows of prophetic things to come. No, we're not rejoicing because the devil's let loose. I like for him to just keep him tied up myself. But then after that, what happens? Immediately, at the end of the thousand years, the second resurrection occurs. And billions upon billions of people that have never even heard the gospel are going to be raised from the dead. That's what that eighth day pictures. And after they're raised from the dead, those whose names are not in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. Well, surely we're not celebrating that when the Bible says, don't rejoice when your enemy falls. So what happens immediately? Well, there's that second resurrection. So next week is the eighth day. But the eighth day is not part of the seven days. The seven days are over next Friday. So that eighth day is not, does not picture the millennium. 
But this feast does. Now, if you've ever listened to Pat Robertson teach on the Holy Days, he will tell you, your reference Bibles will tell you, your commentaries will tell you, that this feast pictures the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Okay. There's a question from last week about this Holy Day. Yeah. Um, do you want it now? or? Do yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. I'll take it. One of the folks that was watching last week was under the impression that we were required to take this entire seven days off from work and not just take off on the high day. Yeah. Okay, good question. The question is for those who didn't hear it. Some people think maybe all seven days uh, are holy and you can't work. Technically, the only day you can't work is the first day, the 15th day. So if you needed to work over the next six days, yes, you could. But God wants you to take off from your physical job, your labor, and, and have a camp meeting. But during that camp meeting, you got things to do. You got to do laundry. You got to buy groceries during that camp meeting. You got a lot of physical work to do. And uh, so you can work during those days. But, but if you can, God wants us all to take off from our jobs and have a great big camp meeting and not do anything unless we have to. But if you have to do something, like laundry, for example, you wouldn't do it on the holy day. So, yeah, you can work those out of the six days. Because there's no scripture that says thou shalt not. Okay. That was a question from last week that, you know, it was about right. this holy day. So. Now, uh, verse... Um, Look at verse 39. In the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, after you've gotten all this food, let's eat, man. Let's have a feast. That's what God says. God's religion is a lot of fun. When you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. It doesn't matter what day of the week it's on. It could be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It doesn't matter. And on the eighth day will be a Sabbath, meaning an annual Sabbath, a holy day. But that eighth day is not part of the seven. So that's a whole different thing. And you shall take, now this is the verse that the person asked about, verse 40, you shall take uh, uh, to you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees. That's why you have, you know, wooden, like cabins and things like that that people like to stay in during a camp meeting. Branches of palm trees, if you have access. We don't here in this area. The boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook and rejoice before the Lord your God. How do you rejoice with, with uh, boughs of thick trees? Well, here's what you do. You make a shelter out of it. You make uh, what the Bible calls a booth. And, of course, now, God said take what's available to you. If you don't have any palm trees and you don't have any trees at all, maybe out in Arizona, all you got is cactus. I've driven through, ridden, actually, I didn't drive. I was with my parents, and I was riding in the back seat. But, dear me, mile after mile after mile, dozens of miles, you don't see trees, you see cactus, cacti, whatever. Lots of cactus. So what would you do in a place like that? you take whatever is available to you. You can go down to Sears and get you a, a canvas tent. Yes, sir. Yeah, in New York, they, they do it on their um, patio, and they just do it like a little tent that kind of thing. Yeah. And they just sleep outside on the tent. So they yeah. Don't make fires or something. It's just like just a shelter, a temporary shelter. A temp the word tabernacle means a temporary shelter. Like a hotel room. Even a hotel room if a person, mm -hmm. for, for health reasons, <laughs> can't do it. Yes. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's a lot more fun when you're in a cabin. In the woods. <laughs> Out in the woods. It's a lot more fun. But that's what makes it fun. And, and God's will is for, if we had several hundred people, we would have a, a campfire, and we would all, we'd have our guitars and be out there singing praises to God and maybe even a few other things, you know, like just row, row, row your boat. I mean, but having a great time. And it's a family festival. People bring their kids, and they just, and the kids, look, I've, I've done this now for all these many years. The kids enjoy it a whole lot. Parents will ask their kids, look, would, do you want to celebrate one holiday like Halloween just for one evening, or would you like to go somewhere and have a camp out for a whole week? You know what all the kids always choose? Give me the week. I get out of school. We're going to go out to nice restaurants. We're going to eat. We're going to have a good time. I mean, the kids always choose the Feast of Tabernacles. Bring up a child in the way he shall go, and he won't depart from it. I'm out, out of time. I haven't got started good yet. Anyway, that's what you do. Now, verse 41, you shall keep it a feast to the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute only until the cross, and then it will be done away and abolished by the Catholic Church. I made that up. But that's what people believe. 99% of people believe that. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. People say, aha, 
That's only a Jew's generation. So look across the page at chapter 24, verse 22. You'll have one manner of law as well for the stranger as one of your own country. So this also applies to me, the stranger to Israel, the Gentile. It applies to me equally. Now, I won't turn there for time's sake, but Colossians 2, 17 says the holy days are shadows. Hebrews 10, 1 talks about shadows of good things to come. So each holy day foreshadows good things to come. Now, Revelation 19 talks about Jesus returning at the Feast of Trumpets. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, when the, when the devil is put away, finally every knee will be able to bow. The devil won't be there to deceive them. And immediately after the Day of Atonement, or I say immediately, what I mean is the very next festival, is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I will turn over there to, to read that to you. Revelation 20, and here's what it tells us. It says in verse 4, I saw thrones and they, people, human beings, who are now resurrected, sat upon them and judgment or rulership was given to them, even those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That means they've been raised from the dead, obviously. And for the word of God, who did not worship the beast or his image, that's still future. And they lived. They lived again. They've been raised from the dead. And they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Chapter 5, verse 10 says that we will reign on the earth, not up in heaven. But the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. That's the second resurrection. But verse 4, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first, not the second, but on the first resurrection. On such, on such people, the second death has no power, and that Greek word is authority, no right, no power over you. But if you come up in the first resurrection, they'll be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There's your Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I'll talk about the eighth day, what that means next week, and that's one of the most beautiful messages that you've ever heard. Now, do you have to be martyred to reign with Christ? No. And I won't turn there for time's sake, but Revelation 2.26 says, if you're an overcomer, you'll reign over the nations of the earth with a rod of iron. All you have to do is be an overcomer. You don't have to have your head removed to do that. Now, I do want to turn to Isaiah chapter 2. I'm going to be reading several scriptures from Isaiah about this wonderful world to come. Remember, Paul tells us in Hebrews, he says, the world to come of, of which we speak. They talked about this wonderful world to come. Chapter 2. And verse 2, it shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house. Now check any commentary. Mountain refers to a kingdom. Will be established in the top of the mountains. Verse 3, many people will say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God. He'll teach us his ways. And you're going to be there with him to teach. And we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. You mean the law is still going to be around? Yeah, the law was not abolished. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 4, the last three lines. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And I stood across the street from the United Nations building in New York City and read that very scripture on the wall. And yet the United Nations has not been able to do that. They've tried, but they can't do it. Now in Isaiah chapter 11, chapter 11 and verse uh, 1 there's going to come a rod out of the stem of Jesse. We know that rod is the branch. You see the capital letter there referring to Christ? Isaiah 11.1. Uh, yeah, and then verse 3. He'll, God will make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. Verse 4. With righteousness he'll judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he'll smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's chapter 19 where he sees a sword coming out of his mouth. He will smite the earth. See, the earth is not automatically going to be sweet and nice and they're not going to acquiesce to the will of God, so God's going to have to force them. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. What does it say in Luke 19, verse 27? Those who don't want me to reign over them, bring them hither, and I will slay them. He's going to kill people. I'm not going to keep those holy days. I'm not Jewish. God says, okay, come here, come here, come here. And you're done for then you come up the second resurrection. Now, are you still going to be rebellious? <laughs> All right. So God is going to slay those who refuse to obey him. That's a scary scripture. Oh, well, he wouldn't slay Baptists now, would he? 
Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Catholics, and Hindus, and Muslims, and anybody who says, I refuse to obey, and bow my, I'm not bowing my knee to him. Yes, you will, even if you have to be forced to do it. So then verse 6, what's going to happen? That the wolf will dwell with the lamb. A leopard shall lie down with the kid, the goat, and the calf, and the young lion, the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. One day in the millennium, uh, you'll see a little kid about four years old holding a lion's mane and walking down the street. Mommy, I got a cat. Can I keep him? Not a cat like you think of. A big cat. And they won't hurt or destroy. God's going to change the nature of animals. Imagine that. Now people say, oh, that's not literal. Hmm. Well, if he can change the nature of human beings, he can change the nature of animals. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they, when you see the artwork, they draw it different ways. Yeah, this just says um, the calf and the young lion, and a little child shall lead them. And the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. So, yeah, I've seen pictures where they show it differently. Isaiah 65, 25 says, uh, it, it's in two different places. Two different places, yeah. Different scriptures, yeah. Good. What is that, Isaiah 65 what? 25, I believe. 65, 25, where it, talks, where it says what you're talking about there. It says wolf and lamb, and then lion shall eat like frogs. Yeah, so it's, it's there. Wolf, but it's a wolf that bites them. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, the sucking child, a little child who's not yet winged, sh the nursing child, a baby, shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Poisonous serpents, like rattlesnakes. A little kid put his head in that hole. I wonder what's in there. Pulls out a rattlesnake. Look at her, Mommy. And it won't hurt the kid because they won't be, they won't, look, well, look at the next verse, verse 9, they shall not hurt. Boy, this is going to be a beautiful, wonderful world to live in, and it's just ahead of us. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. So people are going to know Jesus in India and in China and in Southeast Asia where they don't know him today. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And after Christ returns, verse 12, that's when he's going to gather all 13 tribes and bring them back into the promised land. Isaiah 35. we got a little bit of time here. This is a holy day. Y'all are not in a hurry, are you? Okay, so you are. All right. Chapter 35, verse 1, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom as the rose. Are, the, the deserts are going to be reclaimed. Verse 2, the last two lines, they'll see the glory of the Lord. They're going to see Jesus when he comes back. Verse 4, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. Who's coming? Jesus. He's our God. With vengeance, even God with our recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and, and so on. Verse 9, no lion or ravenous beast shall go there, but the redeemed shall walk there. So it's going to be a, a, a beautiful time, and you need to read the entire 35th chapter if you haven't read it in a long time. And just be blessed by what you read there. Uh, Hosea, I, I'm just going to give you these references here. I won't turn to it. Hosea 12, verses 6 and 9 talk about this kingdom that's going to be set up. Hosea 13 and verse 4. I'm giving these references because you can look them up when you get home. Hosea 14, verses 4 and 8. The first part of verse 8 talks about this. I will turn, though, to Joel. Daniel, Hosea, and Joel. Chapter 3, verse 1. In, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity, those who were in captivity, of Judah and Jerusalem. They are the captivity, but they're bringing them home. So what we're looking at the last days. Verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion, because that's where he's going to be living, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. He's not coming to Independence, Missouri, like some people have been taught. I, yeah, I know people that believe that. And the heavens and the earth will shake. Verse 17, so shall you know that I am the Lord, this is Christ talking, dwelling in Zion. Verse 19, Egypt will be a desolation because of their opposition to the Jews. And Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in the land. Car bombings and all these things, 
and suicide bombings. Notice it doesn't say Israel. Israel's not over there. The, but Judah is over there today. And they've been in opposition against the Jews. And God said he's going to punish them because of that. Because they've shed innocent blood. God knows exactly what's going on over there. Micah chapter 4. Just a few more scriptures. Micah, it comes after Jonah. Micah chapter 4, in, the, in verse 1, it says, In the last days that the mountain of God's kingdom, his house, will be established in the top of the mountains. Verse 2, many nations shall come and say, Let's go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, and he'll teach us his ways. We'll walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion. The New King James says, From Zion. Verse 3, the last three wise nations will not lift up sword against nation. No more warfare. Verse 7, the last three lines, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. That's, that's what this Feast of Tabernacles pictures. And then finally, in conclusion, you know where I'm going next, don't you? So just turn over there. So you say, what? Zechariah. But let's go to chapter 12. Verse 6, in that day, that refers to the last days. Well, verse 3 says, in that day. Verse 4 says, in that day. Verse 8 says, in that day. Talking about the last days. The Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 8, he that is feeble among them. At that day shall be as David. The house of David shall be as God. So David's going to be raised from the dead. Verse 9, it shall come to pass in that day. I will seek to destroy all the nations that came against Jerusalem. That's at the Battle of Armageddon. Verse 10, five lines down. They shall look upon me, says Jesus, whom they have pierced. They will finally get it. This man we've been rejecting for the last 2,000 years, he really was the Messiah the whole time, and we didn't know it. They're going to look upon me whom they've rejected. Now go to Zechariah 14, and this will be our last chapter. Verse 1, that day, over and over, it talks about that day. The day of the Lord comes. Verse 4. Three, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations that came against Jerusalem. It's going to come. That's, this is future. Verse 4, and his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Oh, I thought we were going to heaven forever. No, he's coming down here. So if you go up there, you're going to miss him entirely. He's coming down here. Don't you stay here. Don't go up there. You're down here where Jesus is coming. He's coming down here to be with you. He will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, verse 5, the last two lines says, The Lord my God shall come. Now, that's not God the Father. That's God the Son. And all the saints with thee. So, how is he going to get all the saints together? Well, there are saints in New Zealand. There are saints in Australia, South Africa, Europe, America, and Canada. They're going to be rendezvous or raptured, caught up together to be together. One big, giant assembly. And then together, once we're all assembled, we come down with him to Jerusalem, Israel. All the saints with thee. So when Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives, where are you going to be? Whether you live in Australia or Canada or wherever you live, you're going to be on the Mount of Olives with Jesus. Verse 8, and in that day, living waters will go out from Jerusalem. Where do those waters come from? I asked my geology professor when I was in college, because I had a question about this. Where's the water coming from? And it dawned on me if, if living waters means moving waters. We call that a river. So I raised my hand and I said, uh, it, have, have, have the geologists, because he was a geology professor, have geologists ever found a river, underground river there in Jerusalem? He said, oh yeah, there's a big underground river running right under the Temple Mount. I didn't know that until I learned that in geology class. So when they build the temple, right there on the Temple Mount, and those earthquakes take place like we, I didn't have time to read in Zechariah 14. That's going to open up the ground, and that river is going to come flowing out of the Temple Mount. And for a thousand years, when you go over there to Jerusalem, or of course most of us are going to be living there, I hope, we'll see that beautiful, crystal clear, pure water coming out of the, out of the Temple Mount from that underground river. How about that? Geology has verify the word of God. Verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Now, 2 Corinthians 4 says Satan is the God of this age, this world that we live in. 
But in that day, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And it talks about how all these people are going to come up against him and fight him. And that's why Ezekiel talks about that, that while they're standing on their feet, they're going to die. It's going to take seven months to bury them. Verse 12, their, their flesh will consume away while they stand upon their feet. Don't you fight Jesus when he comes back, because that's what's going to happen to you if you do. Now, verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. That sounds kind of scary, the ones that are left. There's going to be a lot of people. Isaiah says, the slain of the Lord shall be many. We're talking about maybe hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are going to get killed. But the ones who are left, human beings who are left, you and I have our glorified bodies if we're serving him now. But the ones who are left shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, capital K, comma, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This very feast that you and I are learning about now, the whole world will be learning about it one day. And it shall be that whoso will not come up, because they still have free will. They say, I ain't going, I'm not going to do that. Whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth, the people in India, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Russian people, the African people, the European, everybody, French, Spanish, it doesn't matter, Hispanic, it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them shall be no rain, drought. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, they don't actually have to have rain. All, they, they, all they've got the Nile River. They're doing well. So if Egypt or any other nation like Egypt still won't go up, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Not the Jews. The Jews are not heathen. These heathen nations will keep God's feast days or they're going to die. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. Nobody will vote on him. God has appointed him, and you won't even get a vote. You won't go on the internet. Would you like for Jesus to reign over this? Put yes or no. Whatever. No. You, you, there will be no public opinion polls. God doesn't care what your opinion is. Jesus is going to reign over the earth. So even Egypt will eventually bow the knee. Verse 19, and this is the last verse I'll read. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations, the United States of America, Mexico, Canada, that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm glad you're here today, but how many people have gone through this school that are not here, not, and, and, and there are some that wanted to be here and couldn't be here, but what about the ones that say, ah, I'm not going to do that. They'll do it then. So you can do it now and be a king and be a leader or you can wait until Christ forces you just like he's going to force the Egyptians. So which category? You're going to do it. Which category would you rather be in? When, when I was a kid, my mother said, clean your room. I had the choice to voluntarily obey her or, or wait till she made me do it. And it was a whole lot easier to just go ahead and do it. None of you ever had that problem, did you? You know what I'm talking about? Your dad said, go wash the car. You're going to have to do it anyway. You might as well just say, yes, sir, do it. So this Feast of Tabernacles, you say, what do we do for the next six days? Well, you know, take your wife out and have a, give her a nice steak dinner or something special, you know. And I hope one day we'll have enough people to actually have a camp meeting. There might even be, and I think there are somewhere in this area, but I don't know where there are. Actually, some churches there's are having camp meetings. Now. What's that? Well, we could all have a camp meeting if y'all want to go, but I don't know where we're going to go. Well, but anyway, one, one, huh? Is the camp camp or isn't there somewhere like in Rockwell, like off one fifty two, that's got a lake and little cabins you can take around? There might be. I don't know. Have to go up there and take a look at it. Camp Spencer, that is, oh, is that in Rockwell? But uh, <clears throat> all right, I don't want to hold you over time. But let me say one final thing. The, the, the Feast of Tabernacles ends this coming Friday, and then comes the eighth day. You don't want to miss next week because that's one of the most beautiful messages you will ever hear. Not because I'm preaching it, but because the, the whole church world doesn't understand that eighth day. I'm going to explain to you what that day means. And if you've ever had anybody in your family or loved ones who died without Christ or you weren't sure they were saved, you especially need to be here to hear that message. 
Amen. Got any questions? Any final questions? You just about ten fifteen seconds for online. All right. For the delay. I got a quick question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when the when when the devil goes to the lake of fire, it's not going to perish. You just got, it's going to be tormented forever. Yeah, the scripture. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So but our, our, this is one of those that he thinks he's going to perish, but the, but they're immortal. Yeah, uh, I can't answer that in the next ten seconds, but uh, but. Um, there are some some questions that a lot of people have about that. If the wages of sin is death, I, I remember hearing a sermon many years ago. What would happen if the devil himself begged for God's mercy to put him out of his misery? Would God do it? That's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, can you imagine living a few thousand years in a situation like that? Well, again, no, being, no question. Being that they're mortal, they can't die. Now, what, but what if they were to ask for it though? God could put them out of their misery. So God could. God could, yeah. If forgiven, too. He could. If they repent. If they repent, because God's mercy endures forever. Good to see everybody here. Good to have everybody here, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Hope to see you all back here next week. And uh, for those of you in class, we'll hope to see all of you. God bless you all. Have a good Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, not in the end, hopefully. Thank you. And keep on down.